Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a great time this morning already, and I'm so excited uh, to see what the Holy Spirit is going to do uh, even uh, at this time together. I do want to say thank you for the, to the leadership. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, for the opportunity you've given me uh, sharing the pulpit. I'll take that as a big responsibility. Uh, i take that. It, it's, a, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a lot of weight. Uh, that happens in this church, and I'm just honored uh, today to share God's word uh, with you. So I've been looking forward, uh, Pastor Ryan called me a few weeks ago, uh, to share with you what God is doing in our beautiful state, especially in the mission field of government. Uh, yes, you heard it correctly. It is a mission field, okay? A mission uh, field that unfortunately has been neglected in some ways or forgotten by the church uh, for some time. So for the past year and a half, I've been serving as a director of the Church Ambassador Network in Delaware, and this is an initiative of Delaware Strong Families. Now, to tell you a little bit about uh, myself, I am married with my beautiful wife who's with me, Margaret. Uh, it's, it's good to have her with me. <laughs> and at home, we live... <laughs> and at home, uh, we live with Walter. Uh, you may ask yourself, who is Walter? Well, this is Walter. Uh, then you can have... <laughs> Uh, you can have, uh, and Margaret point that out, you can have both personalities here. You can have Walter who is super excited about his toy, and Walter is so annoyed about what Margaret did to him, <laughs> which were in a pub bow tie. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we believe he is the pain of our existence, uh, but we absolutely love him. Uh, but he, this is a little family uh, here in Delaware. Now, if you have not noticed yet, I am a southern boy, uh, as I always say myself, uh, with a southern accent. You can hear a little bit of an accent there. Uh, now, my concept of being from the south might be a bit different than yours. Uh, I'm not only from the south, but I will, I'm from uh, what I will uh, identify as the deep south. What do I mean by that? <laughs> uh, so, um, I'm from as south as you can go. Argentina, okay? <laughs> so you may also ask yourself, what is an Argentinian doing in Delaware? Uh, that's about my pay rate. You had to pray for, to the father and ask him. And that was not in my plans. Uh, and I would say I came through New York City. I, did, uh, I lived in Jersey, New York, New York City. Uh, and never heard about Delaware. Uh, but the Lord, when we were in Philadelphia, the Lord called us to Delaware. And here we are. Uh, we are so happy uh, just to live in this state and serve God in the capacity that I do. I feel that's just, just a, a privilege that I have. Um, so being from Argentina, originally from Argentina, I did not grow up in the American culture. I moved to the US right after high school, uh, 22 years ago, so make the math how old I am, uh, in the United States of America, a country that in many ways is influenced by biblical principles, amen? You believe that? Praise the Lord. Now, one of those influences is in God we trust. We find this in a currency. Uh, I had to uh, do jury duty, and I saw uh, in God we trust above the judge as well. So it's in the courthouse and in many other places. And I thought a lot about this, especially in the past year and a half, uh, when my faith, to be honest, has been challenged a lot in finding my niche, uh, I will say, in, in this beautiful state and what God has entrusted me with. And I feel constantly challenged about this. And I ask myself, does my country, the United States of America, proudly, uh, the United States of America, continue to trust in God? Especially now in the midst of election season. 
Even that's my church. Trust in God. And when I say my church, I'm not talking a particular denomination or a building or a location. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about you and me, his ch children, believers. Do we trust in God together? Because if you don't trust in God and I do, or if I do and you don't, you see there is no we. Technically, we don't trust in God. So I ask myself today and I encourage you to ask yourself, do I trust that God has a plan with everything we are experiencing today? In the mix of the uncertainty, do we continue to trust in him? Now we know that the, the God, we know the grace of God is demonstrated by the fact that he has a plan and a purpose for us, the church. For the mission field of government that he wants to reveal to each of us. So my task today is not only to tell you what God is already doing in the institution of government, but also how us, the church, can have an influence and an impact in it. But let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you have given us today that we can gather your name in freedom. We thank you for that opportunity. So many around the world, so many brothers and sisters are not able to do this, Lord. And we don't take it for granted. We thank you for so many that have given their lives, Lord, so today we can enjoy that freedom. Thank you, Lord, for those who fought for us so we can enjoy that freedom. So, Heavenly Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will take control of this moment, that you will speak to our hearts, you bring conviction to our hearts, whatever it is that you want us to see, to be transformed, to change, we submit to you. Move as you please, Holy Spirit. And again, we thank you for this opportunity. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's get on track on what I'm here for. <laughs> uh, so the first thing is a biblical view on government. Uh, in order for me to be able to unpack this, I kind of have to build a bed of our foundation. The first question that I want to answer is, who is the chief shepherd of all? Who is the chief shepherd? Who is in control of all things? And we find this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. So if you have your Bibles, you can open there. If not, the, um, the Bible verse will be, or the passage will be on the screen. But this is what it says. Long ago, and many times, in many, way, many ways, God spoke to the fathers by, uh, sorry, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And continue saying... He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After the purifications of sin, for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And this is what I want to point out. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Amen? Yes. Amen? All right, you're with me. Everything happens and is sustained by and through Jesus. The world today just goes around and around. Why? Because God is sustaining it. Everything that happens in nature is sustained by Jesus. So who is the chief shepherd? We say that Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. So remember that. He is the chief shepherd of all. Uh, we are called to continue to trust in him. And we'll unpack this a little bit more. But we need to trust in his sovereignty. And this is for the sake of his creation. We need 
to be faithful to that. We also learn that God created and established three institutions for humanity, for our society. And he established each of them with their respective shepherd. So we have the chief shepherd and these three institutions have their shepherds. Uh, the first one that he created is the shepherd, uh, sorry, the institution of the family. So God established the institution of the family and the father is the shepherd of this institution. Now, unfortunately, this is not the case in many families today, but God intended the father to be the head and protector of the family. And I wanna make a pause uh, uh, right now and say, maybe this might not be the case in many families, but praise the Lord that he has raised so many women to take this role. And praise the Lord for that. <laughs> praise the Lord. But he created also, not just the institution of the family, but he also created the institution of government. Um, and the shepherd for this institution were identified as the rulers in biblical times, the king, the emperor, or the Caesar. Today, in the United States and many other countries, we call them elected officials, okay? And lastly, uh, we see this in the book of Acts, and you guys have been studying the book of Acts now for some time, but God created the institution of the church. And the shepherd for the institution of the church are the pastors or leaders within the church. Something very important to know is that when the institution of government and the institution of the church work together hand to hand, um, this is God's intended blessing for the provision and protection of the institution of the family. This is why God created these institutions. He also, it's also important to know that we understand and make clear the relationship that government, the state, and the church are to have. We need to define this. The relationship is not to be an institutional relationship, but rather an influential relationship. Now, this uh, phrase gets thrown on my face all the time when I minister our legislative hall, and it's kind of like a get-go. It's called separation between church and state. We need to have separation between church and state. You hear that all the time. Let me tell you that, even though some people told me, it's not in the Constitution, okay? This came from a letter from Jefferson. Uh, you have to study the context. We can talk about that after church if we would like to. Now, one of this, uh, one, when we talk about an uh, uh, influential relationship, not an institutional relationship, is that one is not to govern over the other one. But yes, being intentional in, intentional in how to influence and encourage one to the other. Another very important difference between uh, uh, these two institutions, the, I'm talking about government and, this, and the church, is that only one of these two institutions is eternal. And then the other institution is only for this side of glory. And I will clarify that in a few minutes. Are you with me this morning? You're still with me? Okay. So what is government? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting co uh, question. Uh, government is a lot of things, uh, but I'm, today I'm gonna answer what is government in the Bible. What did God intend government to be? No, it is an institution that is to operate under the chief shepherd's sovereignty. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six says, for us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. This is a prophecy of Jesus himself already saying that government will be on his, on his shoulders. So what is government? The first characteristic, and I'm gonna tell you four characteristics about government today, biblically, is that um, 
Now, the first characteristic, I have alluded it already, but the first characteristic is that it is an institution of gods. It is an institution of gods. An institution that belongs to him. He created it, it belongs to him. So let's see what Romans 13, tell, uh, Romans 13 1 tells us. It says, let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except from God. And then it keeps going saying, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. Instituted by God. And what does that mean? Remember, there's nothing that the chief shepherd is not in control of. There is nothing that surprises our creator. This means that our elected officials are there because ultimately God has allowed it. Oh, silence. Yeah, that one that you don't agree with is there because God has allowed it. Daniel chapter 2 says, 2.21, he controls the course of the world events, he removes kings, and he sets up other kings. We see his sovereignty. He is in control. So, it is an institution of God's. It belongs to him. Another characteristic that is very important is that government is to be an institution of justice. First Peter chapter 2, 13, 14 says, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and condemn those who, uh, and commend those who do right. The institution of government is to be God's representation of justice on this side of glory. And I want to make a pause for a minute on justice. How important is justice to God? Now, there are many things that could symbolize Christianity. In the early truth, church, the first uh, thing was the fish. Uh, that was the most common symbol. Do you remember? The believers will communicate to each other, right in this fish on the sand, especially when they were in persecution. But the symbol that withstood human times anywhere in the world is what's about me, the cross. In all reality, the cross is nothing more than a device Romans use for death. But how many people today look at the cross, or look at the cross, and think, do I, sorry, uh, and think, oh, oh my, I'm going to get a history lesson on government, on the government of Roman. You think about that when you look at the cross? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think anybody does. Now, it is a century-old torture device, and physically, that's all it is. Now, it also has become the symbol of Christianity. And what does the cross tell us? The cross tells us two very profound things about the Lord. That God is just and God is merciful. God was not, if God was not just, Jesus did not have to die. He could have simply said, my friends, my loved ones, your sins are forgiven. And that's it. He could have done that. Okay? But because in his very being, 
he is just, sin had to be dealt with. Substitution was essential. But we can't forget the second message of the cross. If God was not merciful, Jesus did not have to die either. He could have simply rendered justice on creation. And let me tell you, we will all have deserved it. A hundred percent. But God, in his very nature, is merciful. Jesus died for our punishment, so we did not have to. As a parent, you can be merciful in one moment and just in another. But you can't be just and merciful at the same time. God is always just and always merciful. He never compromises the other. His ways are higher than our ways. Creation always reveals the creator. The institution of government is the revealing of this mighty God of justice. I believe the most beautiful day in human history is going to be Judgment Day. This is because we are going to see the fully just God, which is what we expect, but we are also going to see the fully merciful God as well. You and I never seen pure justice, but one day we are going to see it. The charge to the institution of government is to bring this about, as I said, in this period of time, in this side of glory. But we can have peace in that justice does not ultimately rest on our earthly kings. There is a king who will make it perfectly right in the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so far, we have learned that government is an institution of God's, belongs to God, an institution of justice. And the third characteristic is is an institution created for our good. Going back to Romans 13, verse 1 said, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. But then it goes on, verse four. These are God's servants for your good. And other versions say, these are God's ministers for your good. Here we see two different distinctions. It is an institution for our good. So also those who serve, the second part is also those who serve in government are whose ministers? God's. Remember? This means that they serve the chief shepherd. Government is an institution of God. He created it. Belongs to him. It's an institution of justice. God's justice represented in this side of glory to punish evil and reward good. An institution created for our good, the blessing we are to enjoy, such as security from other countries or even immediate assistance every time we dial 911. Is that a blessing? You have an emergency, 911, help is on its way. And those, number four, those who serve in it are God's ministers. They serve the chief shepherd. Now here we see what the king used to look in biblical times, the shepherd of the nation. We see Pharaoh, Caesar, king of Nineveh, so on, so on. But we are so blessed, and I hope you understand, we are so blessed to live in a republic. We are so blessed to live in a republic. 
I'm going to try one more time, Pastor Ryan. <laughs> At least one is with me. We are so blessed to live in a republic. Yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. And then we see how our modern, modern day kings look like. And these are government. You Here you can see the legislative branch, you can see the executive branch, and you can see judiciary. And I hope you understand, again, and you appreciate the bless, how blessed we are to live in a republic. The freedom that we can enjoy to gather together like today in his name. Not being afraid of our lives. So many brothers and sisters around the world cannot do this. Thank be to God we have that freedom. We're so thankful for all of those who serve and fought and many gave their lives so we can have this freedom. So thankful to the Lord. But you may ask yourself, and this is a tough question, what is wrong with government? The problem is who dictates government today. And that's culture. Culture dictates government today. Unfortunately, many of our elected officials will go with the trend of the culture in order to get fundings for their campaigns and also votes. A lot of these elected officials, what they do is they put their thumb up and they say, hey, the wind is going that way, let's go that way. I'm just gonna tell them what they wanna hear so I get their votes. Even though many things are very dangerous for many lives, like it's danger, but they still go with it. Now I wanna clarify, that's not everybody in government. We have great people in government who stands up for what is good and what is just. That they serve because they take this calling seriously. But we also need to think and be reminded of what government is not. Government is not an institution of transformation. Right now we think that if we elect the right person at the right time, for the right season, this person will make all our problems go away. Unfortunately, that's not true. It's not an institution of transformation. Now, who is or which is the institution of transformation? You want to take a guess? The church. You are the institution of transformation. You and me, we are the institution of transformation. So guess, what does the church need to be today? We need to be the institution of transformation. It's as simple, as complicated as that is. <laughs> because the only, the church, not government, that Jesus told us, you are salt of the earth. You are a city on a hill. You are light of the world. The institution not, not, that not even the gates of hell can prevail against it. And that is the institution of transformation. That's the church. That's the church. That's you and me. And we need to be all of this for today's culture and also the institution of government. So I am the director uh, for, as I'm, there was mentioned before, for Church Ambassador Network here in Delaware. I am ambassador, I'm an ambassador of the church for our state government. I don't work for government, just wanna clarify this, or any party or political affiliation. I work and I answer to the church. 
And as an ambassador of the church, I want to tell you two ways that you can proactively be the institutional transformation to our government right away, even today. First, we need to pray. We need to pray, 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 pray. Constantly pray for our institution of government. This is what 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says. I urge you. Then, first of all, that petitions, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully, we live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Pray for those who you agree with, those who are li you like, but pray even more for those that you don't agree with. You know why? Because in season might take a while for God to change them, but I can guarantee you that God will change your heart if you pray for them. And I want to put this, this Bible verse into context. So this is Paul writing to Timothy and say, pray for your authorities. You know who was the king at that time of the Caesar? It was Nero. You know what Nero was doing? He was burning Christians alive. Put that into context. And now he's saying, hey, you have to pray for the king. You have to pray for the emperor. Even if he desires you to burn alive. He was burning cities and blaming the Christians for burning cities. Put that into context. We need to pray, pray, pray. But also, not only pray, but we need to vote. Brothers and sisters, we need to vote. We need to prayerfully vote. We need to make this election season a spiritual experience. What do I mean by that? That you and me will go to the Father and ask him who is it that he wants us to vote for. Hosea chapter 8 verse 4 says, They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes, uh, princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they, with their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves for their own destruction. As the church, as an institution of transformation, we need to be proactive in who we allow to be in God's institution of government. I'm not here to tell you who you should vote for. I'm not here to tell you that. That's between you and him. I'm here to remind you that as the church, we have a responsibility with the institution of government. If God, the chief shepherd of all, has given us, the church, the responsibility and the privilege to have a voice in his institution of government, we need to take it very seriously. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean in your own understanding. In all your ways, including voting, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So church, let's be proactive. Let's get involved. Let's be who God has called us to be, the transformation the institution of transformation. We need to be that, especially during this season. Now, 
Let me tell you what the Lord is already doing at our state level. This is, you heard this already. Our mission as the Church Ambassador Network is inspiring the church to engage in the mission field of government for the advancement of God's kingdom. And our values are very simple. Our values are we are Christ-centered, recognizing who is the chief shepherd of all, who is in control of all things, even when things seem out of control, no, he is in control. We are grace-driven. Means we see elected officials beyond what they stand for. And this is, has been a really transformational thing for me because the worst elected official is and what my values are and what the, the word of God says, God gives me more love for them. Go figure that one. <laughs> That's his work, clearly. We are nonpartisan. We serve everyone, both sides of the aisle. We are relationally built. That means we want to build relationship with our elected officials. Let me tell you, a lot of these elected officials trust nobody. Because sometimes another elected official can be your best friend. The next legislation, they're your worst enemy. So building the relationships, building trust take time. And that's why we have the ministry of presence. We are partnership minded, means we're always looking for opportunities for the pastors to work alongside and work with the issues that the community, communities are facing. And also we have a prayer initiative, we prayer focus, where we're calling out the churches to pray for the mission field of government. So if you are, if this is kind of stirring your heart and say, man, I should spend more time in prayer for my elected officials, this is a great opportunity. Talk to Pastor Ryan, he can sign you up. You will get an opportunity or you will get a prayer guide every beginning of the month and it takes about an hour a week, and we ask two people from each church that they will pray together for all seven elected officials in their districts. Now, this initiative is not only happening here, but also happening in other 19 states around the country. Delaware was number 13 to jump on board. So what, what, why does Church and Basel Network exist? Now, I mean, to be honest, I wish Church and Basel Network didn't exist. That the church was already so proactive investing in the mission field of government that Church and Basel Network will not exist. But I pray and I hope that someday I'll be out of my job. I pray that the churches will raise up and be that institutional transformation for the mission field of government. But first, we exist to make the connection between the shepherds of the church and the shepherds of government. We want to bring together the pastors of the church and the elected officials to work and think about the needs of their communities. And this is nothing new. Uh, we see this all throughout the Bible. It's amazing how the Bible has all the answers, isn't it? Uh, all throughout the Old Testament and part of the New Testament, we've seen this relationship between, back then, instead of the pastor was the prophet, and then you had the king, which translates to our elected officials here. Uh, so we want to do that. The next step, why Church and Baxter Network exist, is uh, to fill Jerusalem with the Lord's teachings. What does this mean? Oh, guess what? This comes from out of the Bible as well. <laughs> this strategy. We find this strategy in Acts chapter 5, verse 28, which says, okay, this are, let me put it into context. These are the disciples are arrested. They're being brought to the uh, community leaders, and this is what the community leaders said to the, pro, to, the, um, to the disciples. Did I say prophet? No, I said disciples, did I? I don't know. Anyway, uh, so they say to the disciples, didn't we strictly order you, order you not to teach in his name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings. Who, what were the teachings? The Lord's teachings, Jesus' teachings. His words was transforming the whole city. 
And this was making the job very difficult for the community leaders. So we want to fill Jerusalem with the Lord's teachings. We believe that transformation comes from the work of the Holy Spirit, but God through his word. Okay? Why? Why is this? Um, we can fight. I guess I went ahead. We can fight against the fruit all day long. But the issue is the heart. We can fight against the fruit, but the issue is the tree. We can fight against policy, and we do very well. Let me tell you, if you, have, if you don't get our emails to keep you, you know, so you can keep up with the legislation that's happening, you have to sign up. Please sign up. We do very well fighting against policy. But if their minds are not transformed, if their minds are not renewed, nothing will change. We will not be able to get good policy. And this is where it comes from. Romans 12, 2. It says, do not conform to the partners of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know what is good and acceptable. What is God's will. His good and pleasing and perfect will. Once the minds are renewed, that's where transformation will come. And lastly, uh, we want... Um, the state, government, and the church to work together. Why? Because we, the church, are the institution of transformation. We want to find the common grounds that we can work alongside each other without compromising what we believe or who we are. So every time we meet with an elected official, uh, you will recognize some people in here. And I want to say thank you for Senator Baxson to be here. It's great to have you. <laughs> but we can see clearly here two shepherds. One, the shepherd of the church. You have your pastor, Ryan. And then we have Senator Baxson, the shepherd of government. So every time we meet with an elected official, we want to connect with them in three different ways. First, we want to connect with them um, as a person, we want to get to know our elected officials. We want to get to know them as individuals. We want to approach them not with force or seeking any favor, but with open arms. We want to meet them where they are. We want to value them as a unique being created in the image of God. Then we want to connect with them as a shepherd. We want to help elected officials to see themselves as shepherds in God's institution. This is where the change of culture happens. This institution of government does not belong to an elected official, does not belong to a party, does not belong to a group of people. This institution belongs to the Lord. Amen? Yes. And also we want encouragement. One, they understand who they're serving. We want to encourage them to serve in a way that blesses the people of Delaware and brings honor to the creator, the chief shepherd. And then we want to connect them as a partner, which means we want to align with governing officials, believing that the church is the valuable partner they need to meet the people's need in Delaware. Why? Because we are the institution of transformation. I see again and again, and Senator Boxen can be a testimony, a testify on that, or tell me I'm, I'm, I'm right. Uh, but like, you can see many elected officials trying to figure out all these policies because they have issues in their communities. And I'm like, man, the issue, like this, this issue is not going to be fixed by a policy. It's going to be fixed by a transformed heart. The issue is in the heart. It's not in the policy. The issue is in the heart. And they try again and again to come up with these policies that make no sense sometimes. Thinking that it's going to fix a problem. Guess what? It doesn't fix it. Sometimes it even makes the problem even worse. But they need to know that the Church is the institution of transformation. So what are our visions? What does success look for us? Uh, that every governing authority knows who they are called to be in Christ. In this institution, that belongs to the chief shepherd. It belongs to him. And then that the church, 
they will know that the church is the primary resource in solving issues in our communities. There are issues in our communities that only the power of gospel can change because so many hearts need to be transformed. And guess what? Legislation is not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. So this past year, I want to report to you that we had 83 shepherd-to-shepherd meetings. We went from nothing last year to 83 this year. Isn't that amazing? I will even dare to say that a quarter of those shepherd-to-shepherd meetings was with Senator Boxen. So uh, he's been a great, uh, he's just an open, an open door. No matter what pastor I bring to legislative hall, he wants to meet them. He wants uh, pastors to pray and give him a word of encouragement. But we have a total of even more, I will say, 337 connections, 337 opportunities that we were able to pray and share a word, a word of encouragement, share a devotional with our elected officials. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Ah, praise the Lord. So my challenge to the church is, church, we need to be that institutional transformation. In this season, pray. Pray. Pray more than criticize a, 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 a than pray more than critic than criticize. Is that a word to say? Than criticizing a candidate. If at some point you are tempted to criticize a candidate, stop and pray, and then go out and vote, because we need to have that influence in our government. We need to have that influence in our government. Now, my time is up, but I'm t- before I go, I'm going to take one more minute, Pastor Ryan. And I'm going to tell you a story. And this is what God is doing, very quickly. And I'm not going to name the elected official, okay? But Pastor Chris, um, he came to Legislative Hall with me. He comes from a church in Newark. And he said, John, I'm coming to Legislative Hall. I'm going to spend the day with you. So I look at his elected officials, very tough elected officials to get a, uh, a meeting with. And this is how God works. In my mind, I was like, Lord, this is not going to happen. You know, this elected official is not going to want to hear it. Having a pastor come and we, we meet with them, it's no way. It's no way possible. Now, I was walking in Legislative Hall one day, and it was probably just a few days before Pastor Chris was coming. And his elected official, his representative, was in the hallway. And I feel like God just brought her to me. And I said, I went to the, to the, um, to the representative and say, Hey, representative, my name is John Quotella. I, well, I do this. We're bringing pastors from a church. I have a pastor from your district. We would love to meet with you. This elected official says, Oh, well, let me see my calendar. And I will get my aide to get back to you. And I was like, that's it. Okay, that's just a way to say I don't have time. In my unbelief, 10 minutes later, if not less, I got a phone call from the aide and said the representative would love to meet with Pastor Chris next Tuesday. Okay, now, hold on. Hold on, it gets better, trust me. So this elected official is what I will... um, Identify, and there's nothing wrong with that, is a Palestine activist, okay? Um, this elected official comes from a Muslim belief. And in my mind, I was like, how am I going to bring a pastor who is praying for Israel every day or every Sunday and brings people is- to Israel, and then I'm going to go see a, a, an elected official who is a Palestine activist? I'm like, how? This makes no sense. But the day came, it was on a Tuesday. Uh, we met with this elected official. We came with Pastor Chris, and there was another pastor uh, from Sussex County, from Seaford, with us. And we just simply sat with this elected official, and we do a play. So we start saying, hey, this is who we are. We are here for you. And she, you know, this elected what do you need? We were literally said, we don't need anything. We're just coming to see you. We shared Romans 13, and we say, you are God's servant for the good of your community. You are God's shepherd. This elected official said, nobody ever called me a shepherd. Guards were down. Then we pray, and I say, Pastor Chris, oh, let me back up. So they're like, all right, and we have to find a way that these two shepherds can work together. 
I have no idea. They're, they're just really miles apart. I said, what is it? So we always ask the question saying, you know, or I ask, what is it that draw you to serve in government? And these elected officials say, well, when I was little, for some reason, the school did not have a photocopier. We had to copy every by hand, everything by hand. And that really bothered me. So I promise that if I day I can serve in government, will be to provide whatever the school needs so the kids can study. I was like, wow, that's great. Little that I knew, Pastor Chris goes, we go to the school. And we bring a bunch of volunteers that we bring paint and we do beautification uh, projects at the school. And then he's like, and she, well, this elected official goes, <laughs> uh, did you go to this school? He's like, yeah, we went to that school. Did you go to this other school? Yeah, we went to that school. Did you go to this middle school? And he's like, yeah, we don't know the principal. We haven't been able to reach out to that school. And this elected official goes, I know the principal. Why don't we both bring together volunteers and we serve this school? And it was like, that's it. That's the common ground. Now it gets better. It gets better. Pastor Chris, I was like, can we pray for you? Pastor Chris did a beautiful prayer of, bless of blessing over this elected official. We say goodbye, thank you, and we went. Two weeks later, I was going to see another elected official, and literally, this elected official was the next door, the next office was open, so I came in, and we took a picture with, with them, uh, with this elected official, Pastor, I wanna share the picture, but I wanna check in, how are you doing? How are things here? She was, you know, this elected official was telling me what she was going through. Oh, um, let's keep messing it up. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but then this elected official stopped and said, let me tell you something. That Tuesday that you met, you brought Pastor Chris to see me, I was going through something. And I can't remember what it was, but I was just like going very agitated. It was a lot going on. But when Pastor Chris prayed for me, I felt a peace that I never felt before. Is that amazing? And that's what God does. An opportunity that in my own unbelief, and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. In my unbelief, I said, this will never work. But he made a way. And he was glorified. And this is what God is doing in the mission field of government. I do want to say thank you to each of you. Uh, and I, please, please be that institution of transformation. We need you. Government needs you. Needs you to step up the game. I had a lot of fun this morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope uh, you learned something today. And I hope you are encouraged as well. Especially in this season when things seem so crazy. But uh, again, thank you. And thank you, Pastor Ryan. Uh, for the opportunity.